I'm Andy Holding, professional gambler and odds checker tipster. Yeah, it's been a long, laborious journey, it seems, um, right through the humble days of working in betting shops, uh, doing the hard yards, day in, day out, behind the tills, and then sort of working my way up to, to where I am now. I should post. Just the old weekender. Um, I certainly didn't set out specifically to become a professional gambler. I don't think anyone does. Um, so Wolverhampton was very much the breeding ground for, for me. That's where my early sort of love for the game came. And then it snowballed from there. Dad used to take me to the Cheltenham festivals back in the 70s. And watching horses run, and particularly jumpers jump, was what I, what I found the most stimulating. And I used to literally sit in the corner and used to listen to the commentaries. Um, you weren't supposed to go in, obviously, as a, as a young, but my dad used to sort of get, put me in and say, is he all right to come in? Yeah, you can just sit in the corner. And I, all I used to do is just sit, sit, literally sit in the corner and listen to the commentaries all day. You could, there was no TV, so it was just literally, you know, listen to how the races developed. So I knew from a very early stage that it was in my blood, and even though, see, what I know now, the race, the betting is the huge focal point of it. You know, seeing all the, the great sort of champion hurdlers like Bird's Nest, Sea Pigeon, Night Nurse, Pollardstown. How was your dad's betting? Um, that was another sore point as it were, or one of the reasons why I wanted to try and make a success of the game, because my dad, I think he'd probably be the first to agree, wasn't the greatest of punters. Um, he, certainly the bookmakers came out on the right side, let's say. So, if you like, I took one look at my dad and thought, I don't really want to be like that. I'm either going to do it properly, or I'm not going to do it at all. So I didn't really want to be one of these recreational punters that just kept betting and betting and betting, but didn't have any kind of anything to show for it. There was a guy called Steve Goff, who I met when I was, I think, either a late teenager or very early 20s. Um, I used to go down Monmouth Green Dogs quite a bit for my fix of betting on a, on a, on a Thursday night and Saturday with my dad. Um, and Steve was just a, an incredibly knowledgeable and astute fellow that I thought, if I stick with this chap, I might just learn something. And he basically taught me how to read a race, how to time races, which was an alien to me at the time. He showed me how to do it, sectional timing on the jumps, from fence to fence and circuit, all the circuit times and what have you. And being a sort of young, impressionable lad, I thought, hmm, there's, there's a, a bit of an angle in this. So I thought, I'll start reading upon Speed Figure Annual. So I bought a book called Nick Morden on Time, and that basically revolutionised the way I think about betting on horses. Allied to all the stuff that Steve told me, I knew that he, he'd made a, a good living out of betting, and I thought, oh, I can do this if I really apply my mind. I started to see some results, good results, and, and then it's gone on from there. You know, people have recognised me as being, you know, a, a fairly reasonable judge on on, on William Hill, uh, and then the the odds checker um, tipping came, came about um, four years ago, I think it was, maybe slightly bigger than that. Again, a friend of mine who I know in the industry approached me and said, "Look, looking for a tipster on odds checker. Would you prepare to sort of put your knowledge and your tips out there for?" daily consumption every day and I had to sort of think about it for a few days thinking, oh, do I really want to be doing this you know it could be a sort of sink or swim kind of thing you could have yourself ridiculed every day um, if, if it didn't go well but so yeah I, I bit the bullet took a chance and had a reasonable amount of success I like to think from from when I started to now you, you have a, a almost like a responsibility to the to people that are following you so Obviously you are affected when you're on a bad run because you can take the bad runs yourself. It's your own money, you've got a reasonable bank behind you, you know, you, you can take the hits. But when you're in a, an environment where a lot of people are relying on your tips to be good and they, they've had a good run previously, so they, obviously they've invested in you, um, if you are on a bit of a bad run, then obviously you do feel um, the pain that other people are suffering, I'm sure. Me, myself, I can say I can deal with it. I know that good times have come. I know that the formulas that I use have worked over the years, but it is very difficult to translate to other people. Don't panic. Things will work themselves out. And I'm sure there's been loads of times when people have used social media to vent their frustrations and anger that, you know, you know Andy's out of form. What on earth has gone wrong? Is he still concentrating? And what's, what's you know, what, 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 what's he doing? What's he up to? Um, but I can assure you, I still work hard just as when I'm doing well as when I'm doing badly, or the other way around. So this is where the magic happens? Yeah, 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 nice. Yeah. Um, obviously two TVs. To do um, split screen stuff. Nice. If, you, if you're watching the, um, two races on the same card, 
like when I'm doing my replays, yeah. I'll kind of watch one race on, on one screen, watch on the other, so you can basically work out <laughs> who's faster, what race is faster than the other. Nice. Yeah, my average day. Um, get up usually about 6, 6.30. I might seem um, a, a early to some, but to me that's, that's just normal now. A lot of that is to do with young boy Edward, who's now two and a half. Uh, but it's quite good for me, really, because he gets me up about early, sort him out, give him his breakfast, play a little train set here in the, in the, in the living room with his little Brio trains so he's occupied, maybe put something on telly that he likes to watch. Then I'll go in my office, obviously, complete my odds checker duties. Sent over usually between half eight and quarter to nine, so everything's up online. Okay, and then do a bit of breakfast, and then from that point onwards, around about nine o'clock, all the way through to lunchtime, I'm then catching up on the previous day's action, then looking at you know what horses have run well against the bias, what horses have finished their races off strongly, just, just get a feel for how a race panned out. This race is coming up here at Dundalk now, it's called Master Speaker. I just thought you might just get a little bit of pace, and maybe what one we're taking on. I've laid, it to, I've laid it for a monkey, so I'll lose 9 9 too if it lo loses. Fortunately, one of the horses that I think is uh, one of his main dangers, Nick Bay, who has been playing up in the past down at the start, he's doing so yet again. They're putting the hood on him. Could do with him going in actually, because he's one of the ones that I think could potentially turn over the favourite. Still waiting now for Nick Bay and. Um, but it's not looking great for him, unfortunately. He's backed away again. Nick Bay is in, all set for the claimer. All in, he's gone in Nick Bay, which is great. If he comes out, he has done. Nick Bay, one of the best away, losing considerable ground at yeah, the start. Yeah, he's at the back, that's the speaker's thought. Well, he is, yeah, like I say, running out of a trip turn. whereby he hasn't run for a little while and he's just trying to go the early pace, which is my theory. Yeah, he will come out strong, but one I've taken on, that's the speaker. He's towards the rear, but it's this point of the race where he is going to start making ground. So he's just hoping that he's too far back to get the first one. Nick Bay into the home straight. Got Two furlongs to run, he's going up the inside as well, which is not necessarily the right place to be at Dundalk. The one I do fancy to win the race, Nick Bay's going really well on the outside. Flat to the boards, Master Speaker, struggling for pace, I'd be amazed if he won from there. And Nick Bay comes through on the near side, my selection, and I think Nick Bay's going to win. So we've got the double whammy up here, Nick Bay has won, and favourites out the frame, so winning bet, taking on the favourite, played him to lose. Obviously it lost, so I win 500 quid with all the other horses winning for me, so good result. Sometimes I actually kind of like, I can't believe how nonchalant or relaxed I am watching a race. You know, I don't get sort of nervous or too worked up about it, because I think, well, if that one didn't win, there's always the next one. Like I said, the money's great, of course, we all love backing winners, and no point being in the game unless you're going to not try and wait, win a few quid and I think it's only natural that you want to do financially well um, but yeah I, th I think because of the tipping now the, there's more to it than just winning, winning money you know that so people are following you and it give, does give you more of a kick when when a horse is doing because you, you, you'll almost feel like a, a, a group together cheering it on so that, that's that's a great great part of it. On the flip side how do you deal with a bad day at the office? Well a lot better than I used to, and again, that's become with experience. Um, I try not to get too down on myself. Um, look, you know, we all back more losers than we do winners. That's you know, simple, simple fact. But it's making sure that you know the ones that you do back, you, you do well off, and obviously the price is right. If you back enough winners at the right prices over the course of course of a year, then hopefully you should come out on top. But if you're sitting there on your own in your office and you're watching a, you know, a big. 3.4.0 going in. I mean, how do you react to that winner? A lot depends on the gravitas of it. If, if there's a Grand National or a race at Royal Ascot or a, I was going to say Cheltenham Festival, I'm always at the Cheltenham Festival, but if it's a big meeting where financially, yes, there's, there's a good um, there's a good investment on it, uh, and, I, and something that means a lot to me, like I say, if, if there's a, a, a race where I've really put my colours to the mast, like I've, I've tipped something, let's say, anti post well in advance, and, I've got a lot riding on it, so therefore there's more of a sense of relief almost that the horse has done what you think. So that sometimes comes out when you're cheering it on or if your horse that you've got has made a mistake at the last or whatever, obviously there's, oh, you immediately sort of shout out and um, kind of um, react to it. You can't control some of, the, some of the things that happen. I backed a horse yesterday because it looked like winning. It was my nap and looked like it was going to win. It pulled itself off in front. There's no legislating for that. 
but you knew I knew I was right. The process of him winning, he would have won if, if that had happened. So I was right, even though I didn't get the financial reward. It's just one of those things. It happens. It's horse racing, isn't it? As people say, they're not machines. You are going to get horses that bounce off bad, bad run, good runs, good time figures. They, they don't run up to form next time out. Um, but it's a great level of having a child now, because he kind of was almost self-taught me to not worry about things too much. I bow down the horses, pals into significance. As long as he's okay, then the world's in a good place as far as I'm concerned. So I'm, I'm a lot better now at dealing with, with bad day. Yeah, of course, I, I get upset for the 30, 30 minutes afterwards and I'm just a little bit frustrated and like I said, I go and walk the dog or play with my son and it, it, it's over very quickly. I, what happened yesterday now, I've hardly, hardly, hardly give it a moment's thought. What advice would you give to people watching this who might be going through a bit of a losing run or a bit of a tough time with their, with their hunting? Well, if you've been successful over the years, um, then just stick to the same formula. I reckon all decent punters at some stage have hit buffers. You can't put a finger on it while you, while, while you have. You can overanalyze. You always look at what you've been doing. Am I doing this right? Am I missing something? Am I not following the same routines as I've, I've done before? And I can rest assured that, well, like I say, when I have had a bad run, I'm doing nothing different than what I've done over the, over the years. So, it's just, it literally is just one of those things. You just, horses you're backing, they might not be running according to how you think, but they will, if, they're all, if they've all run fast speed figures and that's what you've relied on in the past, then, so like I say, some of them just haven't, for one reason, run up to that level on the day when you're backed them. And it can just be coincidence that it just happens over a two week period that they're the same kind of um, things happening. Um, and a lot of it is out of your control. You might say you might get a bad ride, you might get drawn on the wrong side of the track. And all this might happen, like I say, all in a little microcosm of two weeks, but there's nothing you can do about it. And all of a sudden, another week afterwards, exactly the same things you're doing, everything happens. All your horses are drawn on the right side of the track. They all get a clear run. They all jump cleanly. You get a horse that fell in at the last and yours is in second and it won. There's no more rhyme or reason to it. Uh, everyone thinks you're a genius, but ultimately, you probably know better than what you were two weeks ago. It's just that, that was your time. Um, so what I would say to anyone if they are going through a bad patch, try and just try and remember that. Just try and stick to the stick to what you know. If it's worked before, it'll it hopefully will come good again in the end. Which loser that you can think of off the top of your head has been one that has kind of stung the most? I think the one singular horse that frustrated me the most given that what I know about him afterwards, and that was Jack Hobbs. He was one of the favourites for the Derby, um, but his first run was at Wolverhampton, and I cottoned on to him doing a really fast speed figure at Wolverhampton that day, thinking this horse could be useful. Uh, but that was no more than that at the time, never thought nothing, nothing more of it. I think he made his debut in maybe in December period, and then he didn't run again until uh, April at Sandown, and he was in a handicap, I think it was the Asia Cup handicap, so even at that early stage, you're not thinking, oh, this isn't a derby horse. But it was the fact that it was a route that John Gosden normally goes down. Sometimes he, he does run horses in handicaps before stepping them up. But he was a derby entry that I put two and two together. I thought, right, OK, if he wins this and he wins this as well as I think he will, then that price of the derby will obviously alter. And at the time, he was 50 to 1. I think he was between 50s and 30, 33, so I decided to take a punt and have a right good go at him. So I got some nice 50 to 1, even as low as 33 to 1 vouchers. And he absolutely, I think he won by eight, 10 lengths. And then he went for the Derby trial. I think he won his Derby trial, and I think he was second favourite of the Derby. So I'm sitting on a really pile of juicy anti-post vouchers. And for whatever reason, he just didn't fire on the day. And it was one of them ones where I didn't see him getting beat either. A big disappointment, having mentally almost calculated how much I'd win if this thing won. Expecting him to win, he didn't. And then of course, the rest is history. I think he won several big, huge, big races afterwards uh, and was you know, rated 120 or whatever before he retired. So he really should have won the derby but didn't, so that was one of the ones I remember in recent times. What about one that you remember on the other side of it, the big winner? Yeah, that, that's very easy. Um, number six Valverde when he won the Grand National back in 2006. Again, similar process. He, he won the Thiestes chase the year before. He won the uh, Irish Grand National. And back in the day, back in the early sort of um, noughties, um, that was one of the um, sort of 
stepping stones or the two stepping stones you'd look for for Irish horses coming through, like Bobby Joe, I think he set the trend. Papillon, he was another one, Irish Grand National Thiesty's horse. So you were looking for horses that ran well or won and were prominent in those two races prior to perhaps running in the Grand National the year afterwards. Um, as soon as the entries came out, number six Valverde was entered up in the Grand National. Um, I started to back him, so it was a long, long process of me backing number six Valverde. And he was basically trained in the old, old-fashioned way where he was, he, they ran him over hurdles and they ran him in three races um, prior to the Grand National. And not once did he run over fences. So obviously they wanted to keep his handicap mark down. I think, he, I think he was rated 135, which wouldn't get you in the race nowadays. So if he did get in, he was going to get in off a very low weight. He did get in, I think he was number 30 odd on the card, 38, 39. So he got in off a very low weight. I think he went off 11 to 1 on the day. I'd backed him at all rates, 40, 33. I think I must have backed it six or seven times. Told everyone who would pay, pay to listen to me over about a four or five month period that this will win the Grand National. And um, everything just went unbelievably swimmingly through the race. He got a clear run, he was held up out the back, cruised his way through. I think he was in front by sort of um, um, the Melling Road second time. Uh, and barring action, he was going to win and he won very easily. So it was a very satisfying day. Funny enough, I wasn't working on William Hill Radio. So I had to be incredibly calm and go on air straight after we'd won when my heart was going a ten to the dozen. And it was like, Andy, how would you react to that? So I had to put my professional head on and speak as if nothing had happened. And it was just a routine win where I was absolutely cartwheeling inside. So that was my biggest ever win. Oh, I was going crazy. I, I literally shouted him on from, like I say, from the Melling Road second time around all the way to the line. Um, so yeah, that, that, that got the blood racing a bit. Three golden rules. Um, first and foremost, obviously, be as price sensitive as you possibly can. I think there's an element that a lot of punters make is the safety numbers bet, where they almost try and follow the herd. They're more comfortable backing a six to four favourite because they believe that that's the right thing to do because people are, oh, six to four favourite, then so you've got the best chance. But that, obviously, that might not necessarily be the case. A lot of punters think fall for that more than, more than ever is to try and back too many short ones. There are short prices you should be backing for a reason. I try and concentrate in you know, um, backing bigger price winners because I think that makes a huge difference over a long period of time. Obviously trying to get on those prices is difficult. Each way betting I think is quite um, profitable on the basis that if you're not gonna win, make sure you don't lose. I think a lot of my money has been saved over the period of time by um, backing each way. And don't be frightened to take four to one, that's something each way. A lot of people will scoff at that, think, how can you back a four to one shot each way? But you know, you're getting four fifty in money back if it's in the frame. And if you believe that it's got a massive chance of winning, then it should be in the first three. And try not to listen to too many outside influences as well. Be as single minded as you possibly can. Yes, we've all got friends in the industry and people will tell you this and that and the other and you get tips and text messages for other things, but I would say concentrate on what you know best. Look let your eyes do the let your eyes work for you rather than your ears. Most of my winners, I would say, you know, 99, 10, 99 times out of 100, all my winners have become because of something I've, I've looked at and watched rather than what I've heard. Um, and that's, I think if you stick to that policy, you won't go far wrong. Um, usually get here fairly early usually before it's uh, getting light nowadays. I'm very much a routine man. It actually gets me started for the day, the preparation before the day. I, I like getting my papers as well. I mean, obviously I've got you know, everything I need online, but I do like get the, you know, the actual feel of the paper, looking at the, spinning it through, reading it over breakfast as well. Normal earth, and just stick them on the slate? Yeah. On account? Right. That's all done. Okay, yeah. I'll probably pay that off in another six months then, is that okay? When it comes to the big meetings, I think there's so much um, value for the punter now. The odds are very much stacked in the punter's favour because at the end of the day bookmakers are almost giving the offers away expecting to lose. Um, they're just happy just taking the money. They want to take as much money as they possibly can, open as many accounts as they possibly can because it's a long-term thing for the bookmakers. They think once you know, you've got your money in their accounts and got, got your interest, you'll just keep constantly turning it over. Um, so as a pro punter, grateful for us because all of a sudden 
you know, eight runner races, quarterly odds, normally which are ring fenced, mm. they're just great, great betting races. You know, your champion chases, sometimes your champion hurdles, condi conditions races where, in all fairness, bookmakers have got no right to be betting quarterly odds. They shouldn't, they don't, shouldn't really need to, but they do. Um, so it, it obviously it minimises your uh, losing margin. Um, backing horses each way. Obviously you can make a profit in some of those races where normally you'd only break even or just take a slight loss. Um, but basically they just make, basically lay you everything, anything you want. Um, they offer, offer you five, six, seven and even sometimes eight places. And, and yeah. You can have two each way. I mean, as you probably notice on the site, sometimes I'll put up two in a race. Um, it's just terrific value really, you know. Um, and then obviously on top of that you've got your, um, you know, speed figures which I think give you me certainly an edge because bookmakers don't price horses up on speed mm -hmm. figures. The speed figures are for people like myself who do the put in the work. So you add all that up and you're Aintree and um, Cheltenham, the two best meetings in the year with all the best value possible. The only time I ever step foot in a bookmakers now is if I'm either passing by one on the way to somewhere and there's a price I wanted to take about something in advance, anti-post. Uh, like if I know I'm putting one up on odds checker and obviously it's a big price I want to try and get myself a few quid on cash then I'll, I'll nip into the, the betting shop somewhere and, and put it on where I was closest. So they come in handy if, I'm, if I wanted to get some decent money on something early in the morning and I'm really keen on getting on something. It would only be if I knew I couldn't get on with some of the firms I bet with, or I couldn't get enough money on some, I really wanted to, to crash into something, or I wanted to put like a, a big multiple bet on, whereby I, I knew I was going to win a, uh, an amount of money way beyond what I could win online. So if I was putting a bet on that was going to come to 50 grand or something like that, because they're all big prices, then I, I'd, I'd go and stick it in a, in a shop. Uh, there's four including Corbett's, there's Corbett Sports, there's a William Hill, a Corals, and there is a Betfred. And the good thing about them is as well, if you want to get bets on very quickly, they're all literally within about a two, 300 yard radius. You know, if you know the price is going to go, say on a Saturday morning, for instance, on a big race, if you're trying to get bets on very quickly, cash bets, you can do all three within the space of five, 10 minutes. Though it's really funny, because uh, where I used to live over in Telford, I felt as though I had like a bit of a wanted poster up on the, up, up on the betting shop walls, because I got barred from, there's two main villages where I used to live, in, um, in Muxton where I used to live and in Wellington, which is the next village next down to me, and I got barred from all of them. There was, there was a lab books of corals and a Betfred in uh, where I used to live in Muxton. I got banned from all those, and then I got banned from the three in Wellington. Incredible. So in the end, I was my own worst enemy. The one I thought might run well here, Medici Moon's out in front. Set in a reasonable tempo, I'm not going mad, but it's a reasonable gallop. He's managed to get the favourite into a decent position after a wide draw. He's got plenty of cover anyway down the back straight. I think the favourite's going to win this, Tio Esteban. He's come with a lovely run down the outside. That's usually the place where you need to beat walls, coming down the near side. Other than on the far side is a slower rail. I think the gamble's going to be landed. The number of horses that come over from Ireland to win here at Wolverhampton is quite incredible. The stats are amazing. Something worth looking at that going, going forward. Irish train winners at Wolverhampton in the winter on the, ta on the tapita. Yeah, I think you need a relaxation period as a punter because it's very intense. You're sitting there looking and analysing and you know, it's not good for your posture while sitting in the same position. So you have to get around and, and it's quite good for me. I've got a dog. Take the dog out for now, come back and then from sort of like four o'clock to five o'clock I'll then start the process of looking ahead for tomorrow's tips. <laughs> what advice would you give to you know, maybe a younger kind of punting novice who's getting into racing, who wants to bet smartly and make... Try and categorise the kind of horses that you follow. So you're whittling down the pool of horses, so you're not giving yourself too much to look at. Not many people can be back in six furlong handicap winners, two mile chase winners, two two you are maidens. It's just so much, there's so much racing nowadays and if you've got little time to do it in, it's almost impossible to keep up. So your mind's going to get cluttered and therefore you're not going to be able to specialise. 
I would say pick a category where it be, right, I'm going to follow the all weather. I'm going to follow two mile novice hurdlers. I'm going to follow two year olds. Or just follow a certain, certain track, like I say, Dundalk, or I'll just follow Irish racing. Try and whittle down your pool of horses that you're following and make sure you specialise and know those off by heart and forget the rest. Even though it is tempting to bet on all the racing on the Saturday. And, but if you can, just try and whittle the field down so make sure that you are on top of that, that group of horses and then hopefully you might just see some decent results. And they're off. All right, here we go. There we are, noseband. Back army. Oh, it's just a bit time up for Rev there. The He's going to dive towards the inside. He needs to get a clear run into the bend. That's a good spot. If he gets a run up the inside now, that's perfect. Perfect. Now, I want this Yarra man in front now to go really fast because he stays a mile and a half. So I want this fella to really, really trap on down the back straight. That's also good as well. The, fa the favourite Munthala is stuck out wide on the on the wing. So that is the perfect position there for a horse at Dundalk. The front runner's going off really quickly, and Pack Army is on the inside, nice, nicely covered up. Strong gallop, which will really suit him. That's the six furlong pole. He's still going well, travelling all right on the inside, nicely settled. It's looking good at the moment. I'd be quite confident of him. Certainly been in the first three from here anyway. One or two jockeys are, are hard at it, so I, I suggest they're going quite fast. It looks a good on his tempo. He's come off the bridle, Mountain Fox. All these at the back are all off the bridle, but look at Pack Army, still travelling. He's in a great position there. I really do think everything is going well. These are all ridden along. He's got two length advantage over the favourite. I know this chap stays really well. Go on, Pack. Through the gap now. That's it. Just bring him in between. Bring him in between. So there's a good chance that he will win from here. Go on, Pack. Come alongside. Yeah, it's looking good. There's a couple chats staying on the outside, but I think he's going to do it. Go on, Pack. Go on now, fellas. Stay well. Go on, keep going. Go on, my boy. Go on. Go on. Perfect. Go on, Pack. Get in there. Yes. Yeah, we won, Edward. Daddy won. At least the levels of interest are still fairly high, I would have yeah. thought, um, which is good. Do you got a bit, a bit of a bad run? Nobody wants to know yeah. how you're doing today, really. No. Fun fact. Um, I quite like musicals. There's a surprise. Every year, me and, me and my wife, we go to London and we take on and, and or go to another musical. I uh, love the theatre, love theatre land. I love London. Um, wouldn't want to live there. Not because I don't like it that way, but because, because it's such a an experience to go there and a treat almost to go there every year. Love Christmas, love going to the, seeing the lights, but going to the theatre land and watching the theatre is absolutely brilliant. Absolutely love London and for what it stands for and the, the history and the culture and I think it's uh, epitomising no, no more than the, the theatre land. I think it's absolutely fantastic. <laughs>